Chapter Three, Part One of a Portrait of the Artist as a Young Man by James Joyce, read by Ty Hines. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The swift December dusk had come tumbling clownishly after its dull day, and as he stared through the dull square of the window of the classroom, he felt his belly crave for its food. He hoped there would be stew for dinner, turnips and carrots and bruised potatoes and fat mutton pieces to be ladled out in thick peppered flour-fattened sauce. Stuff it into you, his belly counselled him. It would be a gloomy, secret night. After early nightfall the yellow lamps would light up here and there the squalid quarter of the brothels. He would follow a devious course up and down the streets, circling always nearer and nearer in a tremor of fear and joy, until his feet led him suddenly round a dark corner. The whores would be just coming out of their houses making ready for the night, yawning lazily after their sleep and settling the hairpins in their clusters of hair. He would pass by them, calmly waiting for a sudden movement of his own will or a sudden call to his sin-loving soul from their soft, perfumed flesh. Yet as he prowled in quest of that call, his senses, stultified only by his desire, would note keenly all that wounded or shamed them his eyes a ring of port or froth on a clotherous table, or a photograph of two soldiers standing to attention, or a gaudy playbell, his ears the drawling jargon of the greeting. Hello, Bertie. Any good in your mind? Is that you, Pigeon? Number ten. Fresh Nelly is waiting on you. Good night, husband. Coming in to have a short time. The equation on the page of his scribbler began to spread out a widening tail eyed and starred like a peacock's, and when the eyes of the stars of its indices had been eliminated, began slowly to fold itself together again. The indices appearing and disappearing were eyes opening and closing, the eyes opening and closing were stars being born and being quenched. The vast cycle of starry life bore his weary mind outward to its verge and inward to its centre, a distant music accompanying him outward and inward. What music? The music came nearer and he recalled the words, the words of Shelley's fragment upon the moon wandering companionless, pale for weariness. The stars began to crumble and a cloud of fine stardust fell through space. The dull light fell more faintly upon the page whereon another equation began to unfold itself slowly and to spread abroad its widening tail. It was his own soul going forth to experience unfolding itself sin by sin, spreading abroad the balefire of its burning stars and folding back upon itself, fading slowly, quenching its own lights and fires. They were quenched and the cold darkness filled chaos. A cold lucid indifference reigned in his soul. At his first violent sin he had felt a wave of vitality pass out of him and had feared to find his body or his soul maimed by the excess. Instead, the vital wave had carried him on its bosom out of himself and back again when it receded, and no part of body or soul had been maimed, but a dark peace had been established between them. The chaos in which his ardour extinguished itself was a cold, indifferent knowledge of himself. He had sinned mortally, not once, but many times, and he knew that while he stood in danger of eternal damnation for the first sin alone, by every succeeding sin he multiplied his guilt and his punishment. His days and works and thoughts could make no atonement for him, the fountains of sanctifying grace having ceased to refresh his soul. At most, by an alms given to a beggar whose blessing he fled from, he might hope wearily to win for himself some measure of actual grace. Devotion had gone by the board. What did it avail to pray when he knew that his soul lusted after its own destruction? A certain pride, a certain awe withheld him from offering to God even one prayer at night, though he knew it was in God's power to take away his life while he slept and hurl his soul hellward ere he could beg for mercy. His pride in his own sin, his loveless awe of God, told him that his offence was too grievous to be atoned for in whole or part by a false homage to the all-seeing and all-knowing. Well, now, Ennis, I declare you have a head, and so has my stick. Do you mean to say that you are not able to tell me what a sword is? The blundering answer stirred the embers of his contempt of his fellows. Towards others he felt neither shame nor fear. 
On Sunday mornings, as he passed the church door, he glanced coldly at the worshippers who stood bareheaded, four deep outside the church, morally present at the mass which they could neither see nor hear. Their dull piety and the sickly smell of their cheap hair oil with which they had anointed their heads repelled him from the altar they prayed at. He stooped to the evil of hypocrisy with others, sceptical of their innocence which he could cajole so easily. On the walls of his bedroom hung an illuminated scroll, the certificate of his prefecture in the college of the sodality of the Blessed Virgin Mary. On Saturday mornings, when the sodality met in the chapel to recite their little office, his place was a cushioned kneeling desk at the right of the altar, from which he led his wing of boys through the responses. The falsehood of his position did not pain him. If at moments he felt an impulse to rise from his post of honour, and, confessing before them all his unworthiness to leave the chapel, a glance at their faces restrained him. The imagery of the psalms of prophecy soothed his barren pride. The glories of Mary held his soul captive, spikenard and myrrh and frankincense, symbolising her royal lineage. Her emblems, the late flowering plant and late blossoming tree, symbolising the age-long gradual growth of her cultus among men. When it fell to him to read the lesson towards the close of the office, he read it in a veiled voice, lulling his conscience to its music. Quasi cedrus exaltata sum in Lebanon, et quasi cupresses in Montesion, quasi palma exaltata sum in Gades, et quasi plantatio rosae in Jericho, quasi oliva speciosa in Campus, et quasi platanus exaltata sum juxta aquum in Plates, sequit kinemomum et balsamum, aromatizans adorum dedi, et quasi mira electa dedi, suavitatem odorus. His sin, which had covered him from the sight of God, had led him nearer to the refuge of sinners. Her eyes seemed to regard him with mild pity, her holiness, a strange light glowing faintly upon her frail flesh, did not humiliate the sinner who approached her. If ever he was impelled to cast sin from him and to repent, the impulse that moved him was the wish to be her knight. If ever his soul, re-entering her dwelling shyly after the frenzy of his body's lust had spent itself, was turned towards her whose emblem is the morning star, bright and musical, telling of heaven and infusing peace, it was when her names were murmured softly by lips whereon there still lingered foul and shameful words, the savour itself of a lewd kiss. That was strange. He tried to think how it could be. But the dusk, deepening in the schoolroom, covered over his thoughts. The bell rang. The master marked the sums and cuts to be done for the next lesson and went out. Heron, beside Stephen, began to hum tunelessly. My excellent friend Bombados. Ennis, who had gone to the yard, came back saying, The boy from the house is coming up for the rector. A tall boy behind Stephen rubbed his hands and said, That's game ball. We can scoot the whole hour. He won't be in till after half two. Then you can ask him questions on the catechism, Dedalus. Stephen, leaning back and drawing idly on his scribbler, listened to the talk about him which Heron checked from time to time by saying, Shut up, will you? Don't make such a bally racket. It was strange, too, that he found an arid pleasure in following up to the end the rigid lines of the doctrines of the church and penetrating into obscure silences only to hear and feel the more deeply his own condemnation. The sentence of St. James, which says that he who offends against one commandment becomes guilty of all, had seemed to him first a swollen phrase until he had begun to grope in the darkness of his own state. From the evil seed of lust all other deadly sins had sprung forth, pride in himself and contempt of others, covetousness in using money for the purchase of unlawful pleasures, envy of those whose vices he could not reach to, and calumnious murmuring against the pious, gluttonous enjoyment of food, the dull glowering anger amid which he brooded upon his longing, the swamp of spiritual and bodily sloth in which his whole being had sunk. As he sat on his bench gazing calmly at the rector's shrewd, harsh face, his mind wound itself in and out of the curious questions proposed to it. If a man had stolen a pound in his youth and had used that pound to amass a huge fortune, how much was he obliged to give back? The pound he had stolen only, or the pound together with the compound interest accruing upon it, 
or all his huge fortune. If a layman, in giving baptism, pour the water before saying the words, is the child baptized? Is baptism with the mineral water valid? How comes it that while the first beatitude promises the kingdom of heaven to the poor of heart, the second beatitude promises also to the meek that they shall possess the land? Why was the sacrament of the Eucharist instituted under the two species of bread and wine, if Jesus Christ be present body and blood, soul and divinity, in the bread alone and in the wine alone? Does a tiny particle of the consecrated bread contain all the body and blood of Jesus Christ, or a part only of the body and blood? If the wine change to vinegar, and the host crumble into corruption after they have been consecrated, is Jesus Christ still present under their species as God and as man? Here he is! Here he is! A boy from his post at the window had seen the rector come from the house. All the catechisms were opened, and all heads bent upon them silently. The rector entered and took his seat on the dais. A gentle kick from the tall boy on the bench behind urged Stephen to ask a difficult question. The rector did not ask for a catechism to hear the lesson from. He clasped his hands on the desk and said, The retreat will begin on Wednesday afternoon in honour of St. Francis Xavier, whose feast day is Saturday. The retreat will go on from Wednesday to Friday. On Friday confessions will be heard all the afternoon after beads. If any boys have special confessors, perhaps it will be better for them not to change. Mass will be on Saturday morning at nine o'clock and general communion for the whole college. Saturday will be a free day. But Saturday and Sunday being free days, some boys might be inclined to think that Monday is a free day also. Beware of making that mistake. I think you lawless are likely to make that mistake. Why, sir? Why, sir? A little wave of quiet mirth broke forth over the class of boys from the rector's grim smile. Stephen's heart began slowly to fold and fade with fear like a withering flower. The rector went on gravely. You are all familiar with the story of the life of St. Francis Xavier, I suppose, the patron of your college. He came from an old and illustrious Spanish family, and you remember that he was one of the first followers of St. Ignatius. They met in Paris, where Francis Xavier was professor of philosophy at the university. This young and brilliant nobleman and man of letters entered heart and soul into the ideas of our glorious founder, and you know that he, at his own desire, was sent by St. Ignatius to preach to the Indians. He is called, as you know, the Apostle of the Indies. He went from country to country in the East, from Africa to India, from India to Japan, baptizing the people. He is said to have baptized as many as ten thousand idolaters in one month. It is said that his right arm had grown powerless from having been raised so often over the heads of those whom he baptized. He wished then to go to China to win still more souls for God, but he died of fever on the island of San Sian. A great saint, St. Francis Xavier, a great soldier of God. The rector paused, and then, shaking his clasped hands before him, went on. He had the faith in him that moves mountains. Ten thousand souls won for God in a single month. That's a true conqueror, true to the motto of our order, ad majorum de gloriam. A saint who has great power in heaven, remember, power to intercede for us in our grief, power to obtain whatever we pray for, if it be for the good of our souls, power above all to obtain for us the grace to repent if we be in sin. A great saint, St. Francis Xavier, a great fisher of souls. He ceased to shake his clasped hands, and resting them against his forehead looked right and left of them keenly at his listeners, out of his dark, stern eyes. In the silence their dark fire kindled the dusk into a tawny glow. Stephen's heart had withered up like a flower of the desert that feels the simoom coming from afar. Remember only thy last things, and thou shalt not sin for ever. Words taken, my dear little brothers in Christ, from the book of Ecclesiastes, seventh chapter, fortieth verse. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Stephen sat in the front bench of the chapel. Father Arnall sat at a table to the left of the altar. He wore about his shoulders a heavy cloak. His pale face was drawn and his voice broken with rheum. The figure of his old master, so strangely re-arisen, brought back to Stephen's mind his life at Clongos, the wide playgrounds swarming with boys, the square ditch, 
the little cemetery off the main avenue of limes where he had dreamed of being buried, the firelight on the wall of the infirmary where he lay sick, the sorrowful face of Brother Michael. His soul, as these memories came back to him, became again a child's soul. We are assembled here today, my dear little brothers in Christ, for one brief moment far away from the busy bustle of the outer world to celebrate and to honour one of the greatest of saints, the Apostle of the Indies, the patron saint also of your college, St. Francis Xavier. Year after year, for much longer than any of you, my dear little boys, can remember, or than I can remember, the boys of this college have met in this very chapel to make their annual retreat before the feast day of their patron saint. Time has gone on and brought with it its changes. Even in the last few years what changes can most of you not remember? Many of the boys who sat in those front benches a few years ago are perhaps now in distant lands, in the burning tropics, or immersed in professional duties or in seminaries, or voyaging over the vast expanse of the deep, or, it may be, already called by the great God to another life and to the rendering up of their stewardship. And still, as the years roll by, bringing with them changes for good and bad, the memory of the great saint is honoured by the boys of this college, who make every year their annual retreat, on the days preceding the feast day set apart by our Holy Mother the Church, to transmit to all the ages the name and fame of one of the greatest sons of Catholic Spain. Now, what is the meaning of this word retreat, and why is it allowed on all hands to be a most salutary practice for all who desire to lead before God and in the eyes of men a truly Christian life? A retreat, my dear boys, signifies a withdrawal for a while from the cares of our life, the cares of this workaday world, in order to examine the state of our conscience, to reflect on the mysteries of holy religion, and to understand better why we are here in this world. During these few days I intend to put before you some thoughts concerning the four last things. They are, as you know from your catechism, death, judgment, hell, and heaven. We shall try to understand them fully during these few days, so that we may derive from the understanding of them a lasting benefit to our souls. And remember, my dear boys, that we have been sent into this world for one thing and for one thing alone, to do God's holy will and to save our immortal souls. All else is worthless. One thing alone is needful, the salvation of one's soul. What doth it profit a man to gain the whole world if he suffer the loss of his immortal soul? Ah, my dear boys, believe me, there is nothing in this wretched world that can make up for such a loss. I will ask you, therefore, my dear boys, to put away from your minds during these few days all worldly thoughts, whether of study or pleasure or ambition, and to give all your attention to the state of your souls. I need hardly remind you that during the days of the retreat all boys are expected to preserve a quiet and pious demeanour, and to shun all loud, unseemly pleasure. The elder boys, of course, will see that this custom is not infringed, and I look especially to the prefects and officers of the sodality of our Blessed Lady, and of the sodality of the holy angels, to set a good example to their fellow students. Let us try, therefore, to make this retreat in honour of St. Francis with our whole heart and our whole mind. God's blessing will then be upon all your year's studies. But, above and beyond all, let this retreat be one to which you can look back in after years, when maybe you are far from this college, and among very different surroundings, to which you can look back with joy and thankfulness, and give thanks to God for having granted you this occasion of laying the first foundation of a pious, honourable, zealous Christian life. And, if as may so happen, there may be at this moment in these benches any poor soul who has had the unutterable misfortune to lose God's holy grace and to fall into grievous sin, I fervently trust and pray that this retreat may be the turning point in the life of that soul. And I pray to God through the merits of a zealous servant, St. Francis Xavier, that such a soul may be led to sincere repentance, and that the Holy Communion on St. Francis's day of this year may be a lasting covenant between God and that soul. For just and unjust, for saint and sinner alike, may this retreat be a memorable one. Help me, my dear little brothers in Christ. Help me by your pious attention, by your own devotion, by your outward demeanour. Banish from your minds all worldly thoughts, and think only of the last things, death, judgment, hell, and heaven. He who remembers these things, says Ecclesiastes, shall not sin for ever. 
he who remembers the last things will act and think with them always before his eyes. He will live a good life and die a good death, believing and knowing that, if he has sacrificed much in this earthly life, it will be given to him a hundredfold and a thousandfold more in the life to come, in the kingdom without end. A blessing, my dear boys, which I wish to you from my heart, one and all, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. As he walked home with silent companions, a thick fog seemed to compass his mind. He waited in stupor of mind till it should lift and reveal what it had hidden. He ate his dinner with surly appetite, and when the meal was over and the grease-strewn plates lay abandoned on the table, he rose and went to the window, clearing the thick scum from his mouth with his tongue and licking it from his lips. So he had sunk to the state of a beast that licks his chaps after meat. This was the end. A faint glimmer of fear began to pierce the fog of his mind. He pressed his face against the pane of the window and gazed out into the darkening street. Forms passed this way and that through the dull light. And that was life. The letters of the name of Dublin lay heavily upon his mind, pushing one another surlily hither and thither with slow, boorish insistence. His soul was fattening and congealing into a gross grease, plunging ever deeper in its dull fear into a sombre, threatening dusk, while the body that was his stood listless and dishonoured, gazing out of darkened eyes, helpless, perturbed, and human for a bovine god to stare upon. The next day brought death and judgment, stirring his soul slowly from its listless despair. The faint glimmer of fear became a terror of spirit as the hoarse voice of the preacher blew death into his soul. He suffered its agony. He felt the death chill touch the extremities and creep onward towards the heart, the film of death veiling the eyes, the bright centres of the brain extinguished one by one like lamps, the last sweat oozing upon the skin the powerlessness of the dying limbs, the speech thickening and wandering and failing, the heart throbbing faintly and more faintly, all but vanquished, the breath, the poor breath, the poor helpless human spirit, sobbing and sighing, gurgling and rattling in the throat. No help, no help. He, he himself, his body to which he had yielded was dying. Into the grave with it, nail it down in a wooden box, the corpse, carry it out of the house on the shoulders of hirelings, thrust it out of men's sight into a long hole in the ground, into the grave, to rot, to feed the mass of its creeping worms, and to be devoured by scuttling, plump-bellied rats. And while the friends were still standing in tears by the bedside, the soul of the sinner was judged. At the last moment of consciousness the whole earthly life passed before the vision of the soul and ere it had time to reflect the body had died and the soul stood terrified before the judgment seat god who had long been merciful would then be just he had long been patient pleading with a sinful soul giving it time to repent sparing it yet a while but that time had gone time was to sin and to enjoy time was to scoff at god and at the warnings of his holy church time was to defy his majesty to disobey his commands, to hoodwink one's fellow men, to commit sin after sin and to hide one's corruption from the sight of men. But that time was over. Now it was God's turn and he was not to be hoodwinked or deceived. Every sin would then come forth from its lurking place, the most rebellious against the divine will and the most degrading to our poor corrupt nature, the tiniest imperfection and the most heinous atrocity. What did it avail then to have been a great emperor, a great general, a marvellous inventor, the most learned of the learned? All were as one before the judgment seat of God. He would reward the good and punish the wicked. One single instant was enough for the trial of a man's soul. One single instant after the body's death, the soul had been weighed in the balance. The particular judgment was over, and the soul had passed to the abode of bliss or to the prison of purgatory or had been hurled howling into hell. Nor was that all. God's justice had still to be vindicated before men. After the particular, there still remained the general judgment. The last day had come. The doomsday was at hand. 
the stars of heaven were falling upon the earth like the figs cast by the fig tree which the wind has shaken. The sun, the great luminary of the universe, had become as sackcloth of hair. The moon was blood-red, the firmament was as a scroll rolled away. The archangel Michael, the prince of the heavenly host, appeared glorious and terrible against the sky. With one foot on the sea and one foot on the land, he blew from the archangelical trumpet the brazen death of time. The three blasts of the angel filled all the universe. Time is, time was, but time shall be no more. At the last blast the souls of universal humanity thronged towards the valley of Jehoshaphat, rich and poor, gentle and simple, wise and foolish, good and wicked. The soul of every human being that has ever existed, the soul of all those who shall yet be born, all the sons and daughters of Adam, all are assembled on that supreme day. And lo, the supreme judge is coming, no longer the lowly Lamb of God, no longer the meek Jesus of Nazareth, no longer the man of sorrows, no longer the good shepherd. He is seen now coming upon the clouds in great power and majesty, attended by nine choirs of angels, angels and archangels, principalities, powers and virtues, thrones and denominations, cherubim and seraphim, God omnipotent, God everlasting. He speaks, and his voice is heard even at the farthest limits of space, even in the bottomless abyss. Supreme Judge, from his sentence there will be and can be no appeal. He calls the just to his side, bidding them enter into the kingdom, the eternity of bliss prepared for them. The unjust he casts from him, crying in his offended majesty, Depart from me, ye cursed! into everlasting fire which was prepared for the devil and his angels. O oh, what agony then for the miserable sinners! Friend is torn apart from friend, children are torn from their parents, husbands from their wives. The poor sinner holds out his arms to those who are dear to him in this earthly world, to those whose simple piety perhaps he made a mock of, to those who counselled him and tried to lead him on the right path, to a kind brother, to a loving sister, to the mother and father who loved him so dearly. But it is too late. The just turn away from the wretched damned souls, which now appear before the eyes of all in their hideous and evil character. O oh, you hypocrites! O oh, you whited sepulchres! O oh, you who present a smooth, smiling face to the world, while your soul within is a foul swamp of sin, how will it fare with you in that terrible day? And this day will come, shall come, must come, the day of death and the day of judgment. It is appointed unto man to die, and after death the judgment. Death is certain. The time and manner are uncertain, whether from long disease or from some unexpected accident. The Son of God cometh at an hour when you little expect him. Be therefore ready every moment, seeing that you may die at any moment. Death is the end of us all. Death and judgment, brought into the world by the sin of our first parents, are the dark portals that close our earthly existence, the portals that open into the unknown and the unseen, portals through which every soul must pass alone, unaided save by its good works, without friend or brother or parent or master to help it, alone and trembling. Let that thought be ever before our minds and then we cannot sin. Death, a cause of terror to the sinner, is a blessed moment for him who has walked in the right path, fulfilling the duties of his station in life, attending to his morning and evening prayers, approaching the holy sacrament frequently and performing good and merciful works. For the pious and believing Catholic, for the just man, death is no cause of terror. Was it not Addison, the great English writer, who, when on his deathbed, sent for the wicked young Earl of Warwick to let him see how a Christian can meet his end? He it is, and he alone, the pious and believing Christian, who can say in his heart, O grave, where is thy victory? O death, where is thy sting? Every word of it was for him. Against his sin, foul and secret, the whole wrath of God was aimed. The preacher's knife had probed deeply into his disclosed conscience, and he felt now that his soul was festering in sin. Yes, the preacher was right. God's turn had come. Like a beast in its lair, 
his soul had lain down in its own filth, but the blasts of the angel's trumpet had driven him forth from the darkness of sin into the light. The words of doom cried by the angel shattered in an instant his presumptuous peace. The wind of the last day blew through his mind. His sins, the jewel-eyed harlots of his imagination, fled before the hurricane, squeaking like mice in their terror, and huddled under a mane of hair. As he crossed the square, walking homeward, the light laughter of a girl reached his burning ear. The frail gay sound smote his heart more strongly than a trumpet blast, and not daring to lift his eyes, he turned aside and gazed as he walked into the shadow of the tangled shrubs. Shame rose from his smitten heart and flooded his whole being. The image of Emma appeared before him, and under her eyes the flood of shame rushed forth anew from his heart. If she knew to what his mind had subjected her, or how his brute-like lust had torn and trampled upon her innocence, was that boyish love? Was that chivalry? Was that poetry? The sordid details of his orgies stank under his very nostrils. The soot-coated packet of pictures which he had hidden in the flue of the fireplace, and in the presence of whose shameless or bashful wantonness he lay for hours sinning in thought and deed, his monstrous dreams, peopled by ape-like creatures and by harlots with gleaming jewel eyes, the foul long letters he had written in the joy of guilty confession, and carried secretly for days and days, only to throw them under cover of night, among the grass in the corner of a field, or beneath some hingeless door in some niche, in the hedges where a girl might come upon them as she walked by and read them secretly. Mad! Mad! Was it possible he had done these things? A cold sweat broke out upon his forehead, as the foul memories condensed within his brain. When the agony of shame had passed from him, he tried to raise his soul from its abject powerlessness. God and the Blessed Virgin were too far from him. God was too great and stern, and the Blessed Virgin too pure and holy. But he imagined that he stood near Emma, in a wide land, and humbly and in tears, bent and kissed the elbow of her sleeve. In the wide land, under a tender, lucid evening sky, a cloud drifting westward amid a pale green sea of heaven, they stood together, children that had erred. Their error had offended deeply God's majesty, though it was the error of two children. But it had not offended her whose beauty is not like earthly beauty, dangerous to look upon, but like the morning star which is its emblem, bright and musical. The eyes were not offended which she turned upon him, nor reproachful. She placed their hands together, hand in hand, and said, speaking to their hearts, Take hands, Stephen and Emma. It is a beautiful evening now in heaven. You have erred, but you are always my children. It is one heart that loves another heart. Take hands together, my dear children, and you will be happy together and your hearts will love each other." The chapel was flooded by the dull scarlet light that filtered through the lowered blinds, and through the fissure between the last blind and the sash a shaft of wan light entered like a spear and touched the embossed brasses of the candlesticks upon the altar that gleamed like the battle-worn mail-armour of angels. Rain was falling on the chapel, on the garden, on the college. It would rain forever, noiselessly. The water would rise inch by inch, covering the grass and shrubs, covering the trees and houses, covering the monuments and the mountain tops. All life would be choked off noiselessly. Birds, men, elephants, pigs, children, noiselessly floating corpses amid the litter of the wreckage of the world. Forty days and forty nights the rain would fall till the waters covered the face of the earth. It might be. Why not? Hell has enlarged its soul and opened its mouth without any limits. Words taken, my dear little brothers in Christ Jesus, from the book of Isaiah, fifth chapter, fourteenth verse. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. The preacher took a chainless watch from a pocket within his soutane, and having considered its dial for a moment in silence, placed it silently before him on the table. He began to speak in a quiet tone. Adam and Eve, my dear boys, were, as you know, our first parents, 
and you will remember that they were created by God in order that the seats in heaven left vacant by the fall of Lucifer and his rebellious angels might be filled again. Lucifer, we are told, was a son of the morning, a radiant and mighty angel. Yet he fell. He fell, and there fell with him a third part of the host of heaven. He fell and was hurled with his rebellious angels into hell. What his sin was, we cannot say. Theologians consider that it was the sin of pride, the sinful thought conceived in an instant. Non servium, I will not serve. That instant was his ruin. He offended the majesty of God by the sinful thought of one instant, and God cast him out of heaven into hell for ever. Adam and Eve were then created by God and placed in Eden, in the plain of Damascus, that lovely garden resplendent with sunlight and colour, teeming with luxuriant vegetation. The fruitful earth gave them her bounty. Beasts and birds were their willing servants. They knew not the ills our flesh is heir to, disease and poverty and death. All that a great and generous God could do for them was done. But there was one condition imposed on them by God, obedience to his word. They were not to eat the fruit of the forbidden tree. Alas, my dear little boys, they too fell. The devil, once a shining angel, a son of the morning, now a foul fiend, came in the shape of a serpent, the subtlest of all the beasts of the field. He envied them. He, the fallen great one, could not bear to think that man, a being of clay, could possess the inheritance which he, by his sin, had forfeited for ever. He came to the woman, the weaker vessel, and poured the poison of his eloquence into her ear, promising her, oh, the blasphemy of that promise, that if she and Adam ate of the forbidden fruit, they would become as gods, nay, as God himself. Eve yielded to the wiles of the arch-tempter. She ate the apple, and gave it also to Adam, who had not the moral courage to resist her. The poison tongue of Satan had done its work. They fell. And then the voice of God was heard in that garden, calling his creature man to account, and Michael, prince of the heavenly host, with a sword of flame in his hand, appeared before the guilty pair and drove them forth from Eden into the world, the world of sickness and striving, of cruelty and disappointment, of labour and hardship, to earn their bread in the sweat of their brow. But even then, how merciful was God! He took pity on our poor degraded parents and promised that in the fullness of time he would send down from heaven one who would redeem them, make them once more children of God and heirs to the kingdom of heaven. And that one, that redeemer of fallen men, was to be God's only begotten Son, the second person of the most blessed Trinity, the Eternal Word. He came. He was born of a virgin pure, Mary, the virgin mother. He was born in a poor cowhouse in Judea, and lived as a humble carpenter for thirty years until the hour of his mission had come. And then, filled with love for men, he went forth and called to men to hear the new gospel. Did they listen? Yes, they listened, but would not hear. He was seized and bound like a common criminal, mocked as a fool, set aside to give place to a public robber, scourged with five thousand lashes, crowned with a crown of thorns, hustled through the streets by the Jewish rabble and the Roman soldiery, stripped of his garments and hanged upon a gibbet, and his side was pierced with a lance, and from the wounded body of our Lord water and blood issued continually. Yet even then, in that hour of supreme agony, our merciful Redeemer had pity for mankind. Yet even there, on the hill of Calvary, he founded the Holy Catholic Church, against which, it is promised, the gates of hell shall not prevail. He founded it upon the rock of ages, and endowed it with his grace, with sacraments and sacrifice, and promised that if men would obey the word of his church, they would still enter into eternal life. But if, after all that had been done for them, they still persisted in their wickedness, there remained for them an eternity of torment. Hell! The preacher's voice sank. He paused, joined his palms for an instant, parted them. Then he resumed. Now, let us try for a moment to realize, as far as we can, 
the nature of that abode of the damned which the justice of an offended God has called into existence for the eternal punishment of sinners. Hell is a straight and dark and foul-smelling prison, an abode of demons and lost souls, filled with fire and smoke. The straightness of this prison-house is expressly designed by God to punish those who refuse to be bound by His laws. In earthly prisons the poor captive has at least some liberty of movement, were it only within the four walls of his cell or in the gloomy yard of his prison. Not so in hell. There, by reason of the great number of the damned, the prisoners are heaped together in their awful prison, the walls of which are said to be four thousand miles thick, and the damned are so utterly bound and helpless that, as a blessed saint, St. Anselm, writes in his book of similitudes, they are not even able to remove from the eye a worm that gnaws it. They lie in exterior darkness, for, remember, the fire of hell gives forth no light. As at the command of God, the fire of the Babylonian furnace lost its heat but not its light, so at the command of God, the fire of hell, while retaining the intensity of its heat, burns eternally in darkness. It is a never-ending storm of darkness, dark flames and dark smoke of burning brimstone, amid which the bodies are heaped one upon another without even a glimpse of air. Of all the plagues with which the land of the pharaohs were smitten, one plague alone, that of darkness, was called horrible. What name, then, shall we give to the darkness of hell, which is to last not for three days alone, but for all eternity? The horror of this straight and dark prison is increased by its awful stench. All the filth of the world, all the offal and scum of the world, we are told, shall run there as to a vast reeking sewer when the terrible conflagration of the last day has purged the world. The brimstone, too, which burns there in such prodigious quantity, fills all hell with its intolerable stench and the bodies of the damned themselves exhale such a pestilential odour that, as St. Bonaventura says, one of them alone would suffice to infect the whole world. The very air of this world, that pure element, becomes foul and unbreathable when it has been long enclosed. Consider, then, what must be the foulness of the air of hell. Imagine some foul and putrid corpse that has lain rotting and decomposing in the grave, a jelly-like mass of liquid corruption. Imagine such a corpse a prey to flames, devoured by the fire of burning brimstone, and giving off dense choking fumes of nauseous, loathsome decomposition. And then imagine this sickening stench, multiplied a millionfold and a millionfold again, from the millions upon millions of fetid carcasses massed together in the reeking darkness, a huge and rotting human fungus. Imagine all this, and you will have some idea of the horror of the stench of hell. But this stench is not, horrible though it is, the greatest physical torment to which the damned are subjected. The torment of fire is the greatest torment to which the tyrant has ever subjected his fellow creatures. Place your finger for a moment in the flame of a candle, and you will feel the pain of fire. But our earthly fire was created by God for the benefit of man, to maintain in him the spark of life, and to help him in the useful arts. Whereas the fire of hell is of another quality, and was created by God to torture and punish the unrepentant sinner. Our earthly fire also consumes more or less rapidly according as the object which it attacks is more or less combustible, so that human ingenuity has even succeeded in inventing chemical preparations to check or frustrate its action. But the sulphurous brimstone which burns in hell is a substance which is specially designed to burn for ever and for ever with unspeakable fury. Moreover, our earthly fire destroys at the same time as it burns, so that the more intense it is, the shorter is its duration. But the fire of hell has this property, that it preserves that which it burns, and though it rages with incredible intensity, it rages for ever. Our earthly fire again, no matter how fierce or widespread it may be, is always of a limited extent. But the lake of fire in hell is boundless, shoreless, and bottomless. It is on record that the devil himself, when asked the question by a certain soldier, was obliged to confess that if a whole mountain were thrown into the burning ocean of hell, it would be burned up in an instant like a piece of wax. And this terrible fire will not afflict the bodies of the damned only from without, 
but each lost soul will be a hell unto itself, the boundless fire raging in its very vitals. Oh, how terrible is the lot of those wretched beings! The blood seethes and boils in the veins, the brains are boiling in the skull, the heart and the breast glowing and bursting, the bowels a red-hot mass of burning pulp, the tender eyes flaming like molten balls. And yet what I have said as to the strength and quality and boundlessness of this fire is as nothing when compared to its intensity, an intensity which it has as being the instrument chosen by divine design for the punishment of soul and body alike. It is a fire which proceeds directly from the ire of God, working not of its own activity, but as an instrument of divine vengeance. As the waters of baptism cleanse the soul with the body, so do the fires of punishment torture the spirit with the flesh. Every sense of the flesh is tortured, and every faculty of the soul therewith. The eyes with impenetrable utter darkness, the nose with noisome odours, the ears with yells and howls and execrations, the taste with foul matter, leprous corruption, nameless suffocating filth, the touch with red-hot golds and spikes, with cruel tongues of flame. And through the several torments of the senses, the immortal soul is tortured eternally in its very essence, amid the leagues upon leagues of glowing fires kindled in the abyss by the offended majesty of the omnipotent God, and fanned into everlasting and ever-increasing fury by the breath of the anger of the Godhead. Consider finally that the torment of this infernal prison is increased by the company of the damned themselves. Evil company on earth is so noxious that the plants, as if by instinct, withdraw from the company of whatsoever is deadly or hurtful to them. In hell all laws are overturned. There is no thought of family or country, of ties, of relationships. The damned howl and scream at one another, their torture and rage intensified by the presence of beings tortured and raging like themselves. All sense of humanity is forgotten. The yells of the suffering sinners fill the remotest corners of the vast abyss. The mouths of the damned are full of blasphemies against God, and of hatred for their fellow sufferers, and of curses against those souls which were their accomplices in sin. In olden times it was the custom to punish the parricide, the man who had raised his murderous hand against his father, by casting him into the depths of the sea in a sack in which were placed a cock, a monkey, and a serpent. The intention of those lawgivers who framed such a law, which seems cruel in our times, was to punish the criminal by the company of hurtful and hateful beasts. But what is the fury of those dumb beasts compared with the fury of execration which bursts from the parched lips and aching throats of the damned in hell, when they behold in their companions in misery those who aided and abetted them in sin, those whose words sowed the first seeds of evil thinking and evil living in their minds? those whose immodest suggestions led them on to sin, those whose eyes tempted and allured them from the path of virtue. They turn upon those accomplices and upbraid them and curse them, but they are helpless and hopeless. It is too late now for repentance. Last of all, consider the frightful torment of those damned souls, tempters and tempted alike, of the company of the devils. These devils will afflict the damned in two ways, by their presence and by their reproaches. We can have no idea of how horrible these devils are. St. Catherine of Siena once saw a devil, and she has written that rather than look again for one single instant on such a frightful monster, she would prefer to walk until the end of her life along a track of red coals. These devils, who were once beautiful angels, have become as hideous and ugly as they once were beautiful. They mock and jeer at the lost souls whom they drag down to ruin. It is they the foul demons who are made in hell the voices of conscience. Why did you sin? Why did you lend an ear to the temptings of friends? Why did you turn aside from your pious practices and good works? Why did you not shun the occasion of sin? Why did you not leave that evil companion? Why did you not give up that lewd habit, that impure habit? Why did you not listen to the counsels of your confessor? Why did you not, even after you had fallen the first or the second or the third or the fourth or the hundredth time, repent of your evil ways and turn to God who only waited for your repentance to absolve you of your sins? Now the time for repentance has gone by. Time is, time was, but time shall be no more. Time was to sin in secrecy, 
to indulge in that sloth and pride, to covet the unlawful, to yield to the promptings of your lower nature, to live like the beasts of the field. Nay, worse than the beasts of the field, for they at least are but brutes and have no reason to guide them. Time was, but time shall be no more. God spoke to you by so many voices, but you would not hear. You would not crush out that pride and anger in your heart. You would not restore those ill-gotten goods. You would not obey the precepts of your holy church, nor attend to your religious duties. You would not abandon those wicked companions. You would not avoid those dangerous temptations. Such is the language of those fiendish tormentors, words of taunting and of reproach, of hatred and of disgust. Of disgust? Yes, for even they, the very devils, when they sinned, sinned by such a sin as alone was compatible with such angelical natures, a rebellion of the intellect. And they, even they, the foul devils, must turn away, revolted and disgusted, from the contemplation of those unspeakable sins by which degraded man outrages and defiles the temples of the Holy Ghost, defiles and pollutes himself. Oh, my dear little brothers in Christ, may it never be our lot to hear that language. May it never be our lot, I say. In the last day of terrible reckoning, I pray fervently to God that not a single soul of those who are in this chapel today may be found among those miserable beings whom the great judge shall command to depart for ever from his sight, that not one of us may ever hear ringing in his ears the awful sentence of rejection, Depart from me, ye cursed, into everlasting fire which was prepared for the devil and his angels. He came down the aisle of the chapel, his legs shaking and the scalp of his head trembling as though it had been touched by ghostly fingers. He passed up the staircase and into the corridor along the walls of which the overcoats and waterproofs hung like gibbeted malefactors, headless and dripping and shapeless. And at every step he feared that he had already died, that his soul had been wrenched forth of the sheath of his body, that he was plunging headlong through space. He could not grip the floor with his feet and sat heavily at his desk, opening one of his books at random and poring over it. Every word was for him. It was true. God was almighty. God could call him now, call him as he sat at his desk, before he had time to be conscious of the summons. God had called him. Yes? What? Yes. His flesh shrank together as it felt the approach of the ravenous tongues of flames, dried up as it felt about it the swirl of stifling air. He had died. Yes. He was judged. A wave of fire swept through his body. The first. Again a wave. His brain began to glow. Another. His brain was simmering and bubbling within the cracking tenement of the skull. Flames burst forth from his skull like a corolla, shrieking like voices. Hell! 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 Voices spoke near him. On hell. I suppose he rubbed it into you well. You bet he did. He put us all into a blue funk. That's what you fellows want, and plenty of it to make you work. He leaned back weakly in his desk. He had not died. God had spared him still. He was still in the familiar world of the school. Mr. Tate and Vincent Heron stood at the window, talking, jesting, gazing out at the bleak rain, moving their heads. I wish it would clear up. I had arranged to go for a spin on the bike with some fellows out by Malahide, but the roads must be knee-deep. It might clear up, sir. The voices that he knew so well, the common words, the quiet of the classroom when the voices paused, and the silence was filled by the noise of softly browsing cattle as the other boys munched their lunches tranquilly, lulled his aching soul. There was still time. O Mary, refuge of sinners, intercede for him. O virgin, undefiled, save him from the gulf of death. The English lesson began with the hearing of the history. Royal persons, favourites, intriguers, bishops, passed like mute phantoms behind their veil of names. All had died, all had been judged. What did it profit a man to gain the whole world if he lost his soul? At last he had understood, and human life lay around him, 
a plain of peace whereon ant-like men laboured in brotherhood, their dead sleeping under quiet mounds. The elbow of his companion touched him, and his heart was touched, and when he spoke to answer a question of his master he heard his own voice full of the quietude of humility and contrition. His soul sank back deeper into depths of contrite peace, no longer able to suffer the pain of dread, and sending forth, as he sank, a faint prayer. Yes, he would still be spared, he would repent in his heart and be forgiven, and then those above, those in heaven, would see what he would do to make up for the past. A whole life, every hour of life. Only wait. All, God, all, all. A messenger came to the door to say that confessions were being heard in the chapel. Four boys left the room, and he heard others passing down the corridor. A tremulous chill blew round his heart, no stronger than a little wind, and yet, listening and suffering silently, he seemed to have laid an ear against the muscle of his own heart, feeling it close and quail, listening to the flutter of its ventricles. No escape. He had to confess, to speak out in words what he had done and thought, sin after sin. How? How? Father, I... The thought slid like a cold, shining rapier into his tender flesh. Confession. But not there in the chapel of the college. He would confess all, every sin of deed and thought, sincerely, but not there among his school companions. Far away from there, in some dark place, he would murmur out his own shame and he besought God humbly not to be offended with him if he did not dare to confess in the college chapel, and in utter abjection of spirit he craved forgiveness mutely of the boyish hearts about him. Time passed. He sat again in the front bench of the chapel. The daylight without was already failing, and as it fell slowly through the dull red blinds, it seemed that the sun of the last day was going down and that all souls were being gathered for the judgment. End of chapter 3, part 1